This morning, I want to share with you some just incredible things that are going on. But having been on a university campus, I thought we'd start off this morning with a little history test, pop quiz. You didn't know you were going to have a pop quiz. Who can tell me what that date represents? August 13th, 1961. Anybody know? That is the date that the Berlin Wall went up. And we in this country were introduced to a bondage in a way that we had really never seen before called communism. And those of us with gray in our hair can remember in our classrooms doing the duck and cover as if that desk was going to protect you. That was always an interesting thing. Hide underneath that desk. I'm not sure what that thing was going to do for us. But we remember those days and we were taught that these people were our enemies. And they were people to be feared, not trusted. I don't think it's any accident, any coincidence that that same year, six couples who had just finished college at Abilene Christian College at the time decided the place that they were going to go and be missionaries was Eastern Europe. So they all applied for visas through getting into college, into university in Vienna, never intending to take a class, but it got them a visa so they could go across and teach people about the Bible. But as that began, they started realizing there are no Bibles. Nobody has Bibles. It's outlawed. So then EEM, which that was the birth of Eastern European Mission, 1961, then began printing of Bibles. Going through some of our boxes in our little office that we have in Dallas, we came across a few of these that are left. One of the first Bibles that was ever produced by Eastern European Mission. This, as you might, not a real politically correct term now, but you'll kind of know why it was called this. This was referred to as the Marlboro Bible. Exact size of a pack of cigarettes. And I am told that a good smuggler, which is kind of neat, that that's what EEM's past and its foundation was, was smuggling Bibles. But I'm told that a good smuggler could get 125 of these on their body and across into communist territory. It was amazing who God brought to us, too. Just fun to watch God work. This gentleman arrives in Eastern Europe, and at the time, the missionaries were having some trouble getting the Bibles across because the guards were getting smart. They were finding them, confiscating them. And they were red, white, and blue. And they always stacked them red, white, and blue. Red, white, and blue. That's the way they would pack them, whatever they were in. So when they would stack them up, if they ever got caught, they could tell which ones were missing, and we found out the guards were taking them. Which is pretty cool. Guards were taking them and reading them. They weren't supposed to have them, but they could get them. And they would take them home and read them. So as this issue arose of trying to get Bibles in, this man just shows up, came with a mission team from Harding University of all places, Harding College at the time, and they said, boy, we're having a difficult time getting these Bibles in. They're finding them. All of a sudden, Bill Searcy steps up and says, I can help with this. They said, really? He said, yeah, I, I know some ideas. He said, you know, you can take the headliner out of a car and you can pack these Bibles in the headliner and put it back. You can take a spare tire and take the tire off, take the tube out and put Bibles in there and then put the tire back on. They said, Bill, how do you know this stuff? He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. Well, before Bill came to Jesus, Bill was a drug smuggler, a very good drug smuggler. And Bill was an amazing help in getting Bibles into Eastern Europe. We'll move through our history lesson. Another date, June 25th, 1962. Anybody know what that date is? Engel versus Vitali, court case in this country. 
And that was the court case that outlawed public prayer in our public schools. 1962. Another date. June 17th, 1963. Another court case. Abington School District versus Shemp. That was the court case that outlawed the public reading of the Bible in our public schools. Come to another date. November 9th, 1989. The EEM has been in business for quite a while smuggling Bibles. In this date, some history people might recognize as the day that the Berlin Wall fell, came down. Well, that changed things for Eastern European mission. Had a lot of relationships, had a lot of friendships, had a lot of contacts. And the doors opened wide open. Shortly after this, we distributed over 100,000 Bibles in Red Square. Amazing things began to come about. If you have your Bibles, I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to focus on verse 20. But This whole chapter is... Just an amazingly encouragement from Paul as he's talking to the church in Ephesus. But I want to look at verse 20 specifically. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work where? Within us. To him be glory where? In the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I love this verse because when you really look at this verse, you get to the heart of what Paul's saying in this chapter. And that is, we have a God who's going to do way more than we could ever imagine. We cannot predict. We cannot put this God in a box and say, this is how God operates. This is what he's going to do. He's predictable. He will do it this way. He will do it in this manner. No. He's going to do it in incredible ways, way more than we could ever imagine. But how's he going to do it? He's going to do it through us. It's going to happen through us, his church. And why is it going to happen through us, his church? Because when Jesus died and rose, the promise, as he told the apostles, it's good that I'm going away. Does that really freak them out? What do you mean it's good you're going away? Because if I don't go away, this can't happen. A room full of people infused with the spirit of Jesus Christ. He was limited. Chains have been taken off. So what God does and does in huge ways that just wows us on a daily basis happens through us, through Jesus living in us with that surrender to him. It's a great encouragement. I want to take you to Ukraine. For those that are associated with EEM, you know this map well. And last year when I stood here, this was the map that I showed you to color coat for those who may not be familiar with the ministry of EEM and this project that we call Million Dollar Sunday, which today there are churches all over this country who are focused on this. Praise God that they are. But last year when I stood here, the color coding, obviously the outline in red is the nation of Ukraine. Outline in black are the regions where we have distributed Bibles in all of the public schools in those regions, comparable to our states. Now, for those that don't no geography or size, and I'll give you some little background. Ukraine is about the size of the state of Texas with a road system that is substandard to anything we've ever seen in this country. Outlined in purple were the regions that had expressed interest, but we just didn't have the official paperwork from them yet. They have to go through a lot of paperwork and present official documents. But the regions that were outlined in yellow were the two regions last year this time that were asking for Bibles in all their public schools. Lviv all the way on the west, right on the Poland border, and then Lugansk, which we've heard in the news, all the way on the eastern border. 495,000 children 
who had never, ever had access to a Bible in their language before. We're going to have it in their schools. Well, during the distribution in the region of Lugansk, we met a wonderful lady, very interesting lady, and this woman right here with the glasses on the far left of the screen. In this particular school in Lugansk, she was the principal. Her name was Galina. Fantastic lady. But Dasha, in the pink sweater who works for us, Dasha Novakova, recognized that Galena was a little standoffish as we arrived and our boxes of Bibles arrived. She a little more standoffish than a typical Ukrainian would. So she went over to Galena and she said, Galena, are, are you okay? And she said, oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. She said, I'm just waiting for the propaganda to come out when these boxes are opened up and I look at these Bibles. She said, what do you mean propaganda? She said, nobody gives Bibles, gives anything without a hook. American twist on that translation. Dasha said, no, it's just the Bible. There's no propaganda in them. She said, well, I'll, I'll make that judgment call when I see them. So the first box was opened up, and Galena reached over, and she grabbed the children's Bible. She flipped to the first pages. She thumbed through. She put it down. She grabbed the Bible. She looked in the front pages, flipped through it, put it down. Grabbed the teen Bible, did the same thing. She picked the Bible back up and she said, this is just the Bible. And Dasha said, I know, that's what you asked for and that's what we do. She took that Bible and she clutched it to her chest. She said, we have been trying to escape atheism for 70 years. This is the pathway out. Spasiba, spasiba. And then Galena became the biggest help you've ever seen in unpacking boxes. She was ripping open boxes and stacking them up, and she was, she was the sergeant in charge. Put them over here. Take them over here. We've got to go down this hallway. They're not used to people giving. I've said this before. I'd love to take all of you over there. Let every one of you see it. School systems... Education is phenomenal. Many of these schools have not seen a new textbook in 10 years. The poverty is unbelievable. So this is what it looked like. Two regions, 495,000 students, and because of wonderful ministry partners like you all, those two yellow states are now black. And 495,000 students have Bibles in their public schools, and they're learning it. They are being taught the Bible on a daily basis in their public schools. God is good. Way more than we could ever imagine. He does. And he does it in amazing ways. There's a gentleman who I'm going to introduce to you on screen in a little, about a four-minute video. His name is Dr. Vassil Zhukovsky. Dr. Zhukovsky has become a very good partner of ours, Dr. Zhukovsky is the Dean of Humanities, and he's the Vice Rector of Astra Academy, the National University of Astra Academy, top-tier university in Ukraine. And I want you to listen to some of the things that Dr. Zhukovsky says in this brief interview that we had from our, with our president, Bill Bundy, who you'll see in this video as well. It took place when he actually came here to the U.S., and those who have been on Harding's campus, you'll recognize that this interview took place on Harding's campus. But I want you to pay attention to some of the things that Dr. Zhukovsky says in this video. Speaking about Ukraine, uh, I know that not all the families can teach Christian values because uh, some, some families don't know God. Some families have problems. Some families are divorced, uh, so on and so forth. So not in each family the word of God can be heard. From the other hand, uh, not all the children go to church and many children are out of the church. 
But in Ukraine, the overwhelming majority of children go to school, go to public school, 99 and 99%. Yeah. Okay? So to my mind, in order to have, to be successful in educating people and citizens, children as uh, family members, as uh, citizens, it is very important to use Christian values at schools, in public schools, because all the children go to school. And uh, if we could instill Christian values in the public school, we could change Ukraine in one generation. As Americans, we find it uh, amazingly refreshing right, to see uh, you know, a country that actually is receptive and welcomes that God's word is put into their public institutions, that, that, that there are teachers there that can teach uh, Christian ethics, that they have a chance to, to read God's Word. And I just, I, I just think it's interesting that your viewpoint is really probably the holistic viewpoint, but it is something that a lot of countries have kind of gotten away from. It's something that a lot of people have really just kind of forgotten and forsaken and saying uh, that it's, it's not important. And so uh, that's very, very interesting to hear. Do you, do you see Ukraine the government and the openness of Ukraine for this, do you see that continuing? Uh, I hope so, and uh, I work for this purpose. I work for this purpose. Um, still now, the government doesn't interfere uh, this process. And uh, I hope that the Ukrainian communities also will be, uh, they are active and they will be active in this because we don't have way out. It is the only thing for us to educate uh, children properly. I have kind of conveyed to the people that I meet with that there is an urgency for us to do what we can in Ukraine while that door is open. Do, do, do you see it as an yeah. urgent need? Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, one thing I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of isolation. I am afraid of isolation of family and school, church and school, I'm afraid of isolation between the community and the government, isolation between different countries, uh, um, uh, Christian denominations. I think that it is time of teamwork. It is time to unite efforts, uh, to unite efforts of Christian denominations, to unite efforts of the government and the community, uh, schools, family, community, and church. Uh, to unite efforts of the USA and Ukraine and other countries, unite efforts of different universities, because only working in team, working together, we can success something, because the time is very short now, the time flies, and if we want to meet God's commandments, go and teach, go on and baptize, we, 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 we have to work very hard and together. few themes that he talked about. Number one, did you catch what he said about changing a nation in one generation? If we could put public school, if we could put Bibles in the public schools of Ukraine, we could change the nation of Ukraine in one generation. Let's go back to our history lesson. Bibles came out of our public schools when? 1963, the year I was born. How are we doing? I think the inverse is true as well. You take them out, we see the results. We stop focusing on God's word, we see the end result. Put them in, it's amazing what happens. It's amazing the outcome. Now here's a neat deal. As a result of having Christian ethics taught in their schools, the new government has come into Ukraine. The Ministry of Education submitted a report to the government. They started looking, analyzing the report, and they said, we see pockets of schools where, and they seem to be in certain regions. Discipline problems are down. Test scores are up. Is there a correlation here to these regions? Why is that true in this region and in this region and in this region, but not here and here and here? The correlation where the discipline problems are down and test scores are up they are the schools that are teaching Christian ethics. 
So, on October 27th and 28th, I will be in Kiev, Bill Bundy and I, meeting with the Ministry of Education of the new government. As they have just said, we need this Christian ethics to no longer be, as it is right now, an elective, even though 80 to 90% of all students in the school where it's offered take the class, they have just announced this needs to be a regular part of our curriculum nationwide. That's going to be an interesting meeting because I know what, he's, what is going to be asked. Can we rely on you all? Can you give us Bibles for all of our schools? And we'll be on our knees praying about it and know that God will provide. The other thing that he said, right at the end, about the unity. It's time for us to work together. And I thought about Jesus' prayer, John 17. He prays for unity. I'm praying not only for these disciples, God, but also for all who ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. That's Jesus' prayer, and it's the opportunity that we're presented with. We've seen scenes like this on the news in Ukraine. And again, this is kind of neat how God works. We've seen wounded soldiers in hospitals. We got a call one day from this organization. Bill Bundy got a call from Project Cure. Never heard of Project Cure before, but Bill knew a lady who is one of their senior volunteers. She said, Bill, let me introduce you to Project Cure. What we do is we buy new medical supplies, and wherever there's a medical need in the world, we take medical supplies where they don't have them. We're trying to get three containers into Ukraine because they are desperate for medical supplies for the wounded soldiers that are coming out of this war. We've got to get them to Kiev, but we are getting roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Now, let me give you a little background on Bill Bundy. Bill Bundy, 37 years with UPS, now our president, where the last 10 years, he was the senior vice president of operations living in Europe, and his area of responsibility was Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. He knows a little bit about logistics, fairly good at distribution, and he has a lot of good connections still. Still gets on conference calls with UPS about security issues. So Bill said, yeah, let me see what I can do. Where are you trying to get in? Well, we tried to get in the port in Odessa. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Containers are getting put off in Odessa, and who knows what's in them? Nobody knows. The inventory situation there is abysmal. You're not getting in Crimea. So he worked it out, got them in through Germany into Poland, railed it up to Kiev. They get to Kiev. They're unloading the supplies. The people there are just elated, the people that are receiving it. They're putting the supplies in the hospital. And one of the lead Ukrainians comes to this woman who made the call to Bill to get the help to get medical supplies into Ukraine. And she says, I don't know if you can help us with this. I know that you do medical supplies, but I just thought I'd ask. The one thing that tons of our soldiers ask for while they're in the hospital bed is a Bible. Do you have any idea where we might be able to get Bibles in our language? And Jeannie Martin said, yeah, I think I do. Let me make a call. So we are now distributing, at a time, 3,000 Bibles to 3,000 hospital beds. Now, they wanted, the, they wanted the Bible to stay at the hospital bed. We said, we're going to give them. This is the only request we're going to make. You give it to the soldier. Let him take it home with him. The Ukrainian said, you would do that? I said, yep, just tell us when they are discharged and when you need another one. So now we're in a regular rotation of providing the Ukrainian military with Bibles. 
Now, why did Jeannie Martin call Bill Bundy? Because God, because God's involved. And I reminded Bill of this. It's the Esther moment, and we all have them. We all have those opportunities. When God says, hey, I want you to do it, but you know what? If you don't do it, it's all right. Somebody else will do it. Somebody else is going to step in. And it's a reminder of God's power and how he works in us and how he works in all of us to encourage us. And we see his magnificence and his might. So this is what the map looks like now. Three regions. Kershaw, Zaporozhye, and Ternopil. Kershaw has not only asked for Bibles in all of their public schools, but they've asked for them in all 27 of their public universities. First time we've ever had that request. The goal this million dollar Sunday, $2.1 million. $950 provides one school with all the Bibles they need. Or you can sponsor a child for $5 reading. Because once the Bible's there, the great thing is, it's there. And it keeps being read. It's in perpetuity as long as that Bible lasts. And then, of course, the requests come in. I've showed this before, but I think it's important, the economic comparison. Because people ask us all the time, why, why do you give the Bibles? You know, isn't it better to ask people to pay a little bit? And I understand that. But when you look at this nation that we're dealing with, the percentage of the population below the poverty line, it's right up there with Uganda and Tanzania. Now, oftentimes we've looked at the GDP. For the first time, if you're watching the news, the GDP is dropping. Average monthly income for a Ukrainian before the crisis, before all this war happened, was $400 a month. Now, 286 So if you look at their GDP, a lot of times people would say, well, their GDP is pretty good. But that doesn't really tell you about the nation. You look at the GNI, the gross national income. And the best way to look at it is per $100 of GDP. So for every $100 of GDP, how much is that creating an income coming back to the people? And if you look at Ukraine, compared to some other countries, we're at $83.23. Honduras, $31.56. Ukraine, $11.76. Now, that's old data because that's off the CIA website, and it's not updated based on the numbers by this war. But you know, these people are phenomenal because you give them a Bible, and they read it, and they digest it, and they're brilliant, and they're so open, they allow it to transform them because they're not proud, as Denny talked about in class. They are humble. And they're vulnerable. And they want to be changed. They want to know this God, this creator. And so in their poverty, you see scenes like this. Now these ladies, this is not once a week, once a month. This is every day. In their poverty, if you've ever been to Ukraine, you get to love borscht or you just go hungry. But they make pots of borscht. They load it in the back of their beat-up car. And every day, they take it to people who to them are poor. And they feed them. Because they get God's word and they say, Oh, we got to take care of each other. So they feed each other, they clothe each other, they take care of the orphans, they take care of widows, because it's right there in black and white. It's not rocket science. And they're changed. And they will use this verse. I've had them say this verse to me. Well, Jesus says, why do we do this? Because from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And I hear this from these people who have nothing and I feel this big. They get it. They understand. So this morning, 
I don't know where you are in your walk, but I hope and pray that if the ministry of EEM does nothing more than to convict you on the gift that we've got in having God's word and to be humble and vulnerable to it, to seek God's guidance, to look at pictures like this and to realize that for $950, we can provide one entire school with all the Bibles they need. $150 will provide a, a classroom and $5 will provide one of these beautiful children a Bible that they've never, ever had before. And then inside of ourselves to say, how am I doing? What am I doing? How am I spending time with God? Am I? Or am I more passionate about a Razorback loss than I am for the lost souls that are around me and the loss of a relationship that I don't have. Am I content with not striving to know God better? This life is a mist, and it'll be over. We have an opportunity to know a God who is desperately wanting to know us, wanting to call us into relationship. Whatever you need this morning, I don't know what that might be, but I've been here enough to know there is a bunch of great people. And this is a family, if you've not said, hey, this is where I want to be. If I lived closer, I'd be here. This is where I'd call home. Whatever your need is, come together as we stand and sing this morning.